so uh, hello everyone, welcome to the second session of ITCS. The main topic of this session will be on complexity theory, including randomization, average case complexity and crypto, and harness of approximation and, uni and unigame conjecture, and also pseudo random self reduction. So each speaker has 11 minutes of talk time and one minute of question time. And the question time also allows the next speaker to, to set up. And I will try to hint you when you are running out of your talk time. So first, welcome Ronan to give the first talk on PRG. OK, so hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you see the screen? OK, so my name is Ronan Chartier. And I'm going to talk about how this uh, assumption is needed for extreme high end pseudo random generated and fast randomization. And this is joint work with Emmanuel Eliola. Uh, okay, so uh, in 97, in Pagliazzo, Nicholson showed uh, that BPP equals P, assuming certain complexity theoretic hardness assumptions. More specifically, they showed how to construct high end pseudo random generators. And by that, I mean, pseudo-random generators that stretch order of log m uh, uh, random bits into m pseudo-random bits. And such pseudo-random generators are optimal up to constant factors and are based on assumptions that are necessary at least up to constant factors. So this is the result of Impagliazzo and Rick Vezon. And as we all know, a pseudo-random generator is a function that stretches r bits into uh, m bits. And it, such that for every circuit D of size M, I'm using circuits of size exactly the uh, size of the output. And, and the circuit D does not distinguish the uniform distribution from the output of a pseudo random generator. And the distinguishing advantage that I'm looking at is a constant, let's say one over 10. So what Impagliazzo and Wigdeson did is that they constructed these high, uh, pseudo random generators, which are called high end. They are optimal up to constant. What do I mean by that? That the C length is optimal up to a constant. It's order of log n. The best you can hope for is one times log n. And they use the assumptions which are necessary, at least up to constant. They are implied from such pseudo random generators, at least up to a constant factors. And uh, it is well known that if you have a high end pseudo random generator, then BPP equals P. Or in other words, there exists a constant C such that every randomized algorithm running in time M can be simulated in deterministic time M to the C. And this is great. We all like this theory. Uh, recently, motivated by fast derandomization, fast derandomization meaning, means trying to get the most efficient simulation that you can get, say, trying to minimize this constant C, two beautiful papers, one by uh, Doron, Moshkovitz, O, and Zukema, and the other by Chen and Tel, I'll refer to these two papers as DEMOS and CT from now on, construct what I'll call extreme high-end pseudo-random generators. What are extreme high-end pseudo-random generators? These are generators which are not only optimal up to constant factors, but they are optimizing their constants. They're, they're optimal up to one plus little o of one factors. They stretch one plus little o of one log m random bits into m pseudo-random bits. So these are stronger pseudo-random generators. And these two works constructed these pseudo-random generators, these, ex these extreme high-end pseudo-random generators based on stronger assumptions where the assumptions are stronger, both quantitatively and qualitatively. Now, qualitatively stronger assumptions are in some sense necessary because we want a, a, a quality, sorry, quantitatively stronger assumptions are in some sense necessary because we want quantitatively stronger pseudo-random generators. We want pseudo-random generators with better stretch, but it's not at all clear that we need a, a qualitatively stronger assumptions. And, it, and indeed, the open problem that we want to consider is whether we can get extreme high-end pseudo-random generators based on the impagliazzo zone assumption without changing it qualitatively and only quantitatively scaling it so that it will be uh, correct for extreme high-end pseudo-random generators. So this is the problem that we want to look at. And the issue why we, why we can't use the old proofs, the starting from Impagliazzo, Vigdeson, and later work, is that we can't use hardness simplification in the hybrid argument. It costs too much if you want to construct extreme high-end pseudo-random generators. 
Now, I'm interested in proving limitations, improving lower bounds on proof techniques. And this is, and for that reason, the way I want to state this problem is in the following way. The question that I want to ask is, is there a black box proof for the open problem? Because what I'll try to show is that there's no black box proof. And I'll call a black box proof from the, a, a quantitatively properly scaled in Pagliazzo Vigdesol assumption to extreme high end to a random generator, an extreme black box proof. So what, this, what, what, what we are interested in in this paper is does there exist an extreme black box proof? And the answer is that we don't know but we can rule out certain approaches. So what are our results? Uh, our first result is that uh, in every black box proof, even a black box proof that is not extreme, the construction that takes a, a hard function F and maps it into a pseudo random generator G must have certain specific properties. More precisely, it is well known that every black box pseudo random generator is also an extractor. This is a celebrated result of Chevy Samsung 99. And what we show is that every black box pseudo random generator, when we view it as an extractor, has a certain property that we interpret as a weakness. So, what is this property? The property is that when you think of a black box pseudo random generator as an extractor, there is a large entropy source on which quite a few outputs of this extractor are, are fixed. Now, this doesn't contradict the fact that this is an assumption, but typical extractors do not have this property. And by that, I mean that if you were to uh, choose a function at random, then with high probability, it will be an extractor. This is a standard calculation. Nevertheless, what we show is that if you take a random function, it is unlikely to have this property or this weakness as an extractor. And the way we interpret this is that there is a difference between black box pseudo random generators and extractors. And this may explain why it is hard to come up with new black box proofs of pseudo random uh, uh, generators. Moreover, now that we know how uh, uh, such black box proofs should look like, how the construction should look like, maybe it will now be easier to find new constructions because we know that the ones that we do have, uh, uh, although they work in the high end, they fail in the extreme high. And this uh, uh, approach is also used to prove the next result I'm going to tell you about. So the next result I'm going to tell you about is that the approach of uh, DEMOS cannot yield an extreme black box proof. So what do I mean by that? DEMOS use an approach which I'll call a pseudo entropy generator plus extractor, which was already suggested in the past. More specifically, a pseudo a PEG, a pseudo entropy generator, is a weak form of a pseudo random generator, which doesn't guarantee that the output distribution is pseudo random. Instead, it only guarantees that the output distribution has large computational entropy. So it's a weaker form of a pseudo random generator. And if you want to construct a pseudo random generator, the a PEG plus extractor approach is to first use your hardness assumption, the hard function, to construct a pseudo entropy generator. And then in order to construct the final pseudo random generator G, apply an extractor on the output of a pseudo entropy generator to extract this computational uh, entropy. And this is the approach used by DEMOS. Now, if you want this constructed pseudo random generator G to be extreme, if you want it to have very short seed, then since we're already paying for the seed length for the extractor, then the seed length for the pseudo entropy generator must be extremely short. It should be shorter than the best possible seed for pseudo random generators. And, and this is indeed what DEMOS achieve. Uh, and our result is that if you try to uh, uh, look at black box proofs that construct PEGs from the quantitatively properly scaled in Pagliazzo Vigdeson assumption, if you want to imitate the approach of DEMOS, uh, from the assumption that we, we are used to assuming, then such black box proofs cannot have very short uh, seed P, uh, for PEGs. The PEG that you will construct cannot have a very short seed, and therefore it is impossible to have an extreme black box proof using the PEG plus extractor approach. And uh, 
This same uh, uh, proof also implies a limitation on uh, pseudo-random generators for quantified their randomization because they are closely related to pseudo-entropy generator. And this explains in retrospect why the paper of DMOS uses additional assumptions. Just to say, I'll mention that DMOS uses a, a qualitatively stronger a, a, a assumption than the one used by impaliazzo Wittesson, in which the hard function is also hard not only for deterministic circuits, but also for a version of non-deterministic circuits. Right? So now we have an excuse why we, we, we're not supposed to use that approach to get, to get such a result, assuming the assumption that we like to assume, the impaliazzo Wittesson assumption. Uh, our third result concerns the paper of Chen and Tell, uh, CT, and it shows that the approach of Chen and Tell can't yield an extreme black box proof. But here, the limitation that we show only holds if you use harvest amplification and the hybrid argument. So let me survey this result. So what is the approach used by uh, Chen and Tell? Chen and Tell use an approach which I'll call the PRG composition approach. More specifically, they construct the pseudo-random generator G by composing two pseudo-random generators, where the first generator, G1, is a generator that is constructed from the uh, assumption that we're used to assuming, from the quantitatively properly scaled impariazzo business on assumption, and it uses the tools that we are used to using a hardness amplification and the hybrid argument. And one way to think about this uh, first generator is that we, we, this is basically pushing what we know about the uh, uh, hardness amplification and hybrid argument to the limit. So G1 is the best we, we know how to do with hardness amplification and the hybrid argument. And then we compose this generator G1 with a second generator G2. G2 is a generator with mild stretch. It has polynomial stretch and not exponential stretch, but it needs to have additional properties. For example, it needs to, it needs to run in almost linear time in the output length in order for this, both, both for this composition to be correct. And we don't know how to construct pseudo, such pseudo random generators from the uh, impaliazzo on type assumption. And because of that, a CT assume the existence of one-way functions or cryptography to obtain cryptographic pseudo-random generators, which have this property. They have polynomial stretch and they can run in almost linear time in the output length. A natural question that you can ask when you look at this PRG composition is, can we, the, the pseudo-random generator G1 is already constructed from the assumption that we like assuming, right? So can we use the quantitatively properly scaled in Pagliazzo Vigdes on assumption with a black box proof to construct a pseudo random generator G2, if we could do that, then we could get rid of the additional assumption. Okay. And our result is that it's impossible for black box proofs that use hardness amplification and the hybrid argument. And this explains in retrospect why Chen and Tell need to use additional assumptions, but unlike the previous result, it doesn't rule out that maybe the PRG composition approach can be carried out without harness amplification the hybrid argument via some uh, different argument that we haven't discovered yet. And the result that we actually show here is what is called lower bounds on hardness amplification, or if you're a coding theorist, this is a lower bound on the number of queries of locally this decodable codes with huge List and it is related to past works in this area, but it uses very different techniques because somehow this a, a setting of the extreme high end hey, is sorry, much more challenging. A minute, a ten second. Sorry. Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, 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 so this is a summary of the talk. Let me also comment that there are additional ways in which one can hope to construct. In what we how, which one can hope to can hope to prove BPP equals P or do fast derandomization based on hard functions, and we don't rule out these additional approaches. For specifically a new paper by Chen and Tell from last year, and let me just mention two open problems. One, uh, do we really need to pay the cost of the hardness amplification and the hybrid argument in black box proof for constructing pseudo random generators? I'm not sure what the right answer is whether we should or shouldn't. But if we shouldn't, and we're hoping to prove 
a limitation on, on black box proofs. But as you can see, we need to develop techniques to prove even weak bounds on general black box proofs of pseudo random generators, because as you can see, our results only handle black box proof with specific approaches like uh, PEG plus extractor or PRG composition. Right? So, this is so uh, these are open programs. So, thank you, and that's it. Yeah, thanks so much, Rona, for the very interesting talk. Uh, we probably don't have time for questions now. So if you have questions, just ask in the chat and uh, welcome the next speaker, uh, Rahul, uh, giving a talk on errorless versus error-prone average case complexity. Uh, Rahul, do you want to share uh, your slide? Yeah, sorry, just trying to do that. Just think. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay, in the meantime, I guess I want to ask, does your PRG results apply to heating set generator as well? Just how about heating set generator? Just a random question comes to my mind. Uh... It, it doesn't. It, I, I don't think it uh, it rules out heating set generators, but it does it does rule out pseudo random generators with error that approaches one. I see. Right? Okay. I see. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So now let's wrap that kind of Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Lejia. Um So I'm going to be speaking about errorless versus error prone average case complexity, um, and uh, this is joint work with Shuichi Hirahara. Um, Okay, so um, the focus of this talk is on two uh, notions of average case complexity. Um, so when we're talking about average case complexity, we're studying distributional problems. So we have a computational problem, um, a, a language, perhaps a research problem together with the distribution. Um, and we want to solve the problem um, with uh, high probability over the distribution instances. So uh, in this case, let's just focus on version problems, languages, and consider some sequence of distributions over inputs of size n. The question is, given an input sample from this distribution, um, say d sub n or instance of length n, can you efficiently decide whether x is an L or not with high probability? So here the randomness is just over the instances. Um, or in other words, the addition problem L easy on average with respect to d. And uh, there's two natural ways, at least, in which you can uh, you can model this problem. Um, and this corresponds to um, whether you're allowed to make errors or not. Um, when um, you so for, for most instances, you'll be given the correct answer. And when you're not giving the correct answer, um, do you know that you're not giving the correct answer? And therefore, will you be able to say that you don't know? Um, uh, because uh, so either you give the correct answer, or you don't know, or may, may sometimes make a mistake. And these notions have both been considered extensively in the literature. So the first notion is errorless, where you don't make a mistake, and the second is error prone. Um, so uh, the first notion of errorless is often called average P, um, when you're talking about uh, decision uh, by polynomial time algorithms, and the error prone version uh, is often referred to as heuristic P. Um, so we sort of study the, um, um, the relationship between these two notions. And this is a very natural question. And um, as I'll say later, it was raised already by Pagliazzo in his well-known survey on average case complexity, but it doesn't seem to have received um, much attention. Um, so uh, as far as we know, the first to systematically study relating these, these notions. Um, in, in some ways, it's analogous to ZPP versus BPP, which is a far more well-known problem. Um, how does zero error probabilistic time relate to boundary probabilistic time? In this case, um, that we're considering here, the error is over the space of instances rather than over the randomness of an algorithm. So just for some motivation, um, uh, let's consider this. Uh, there's a survey of Impazo that I just mentioned, and he describes five possible worlds of uh, complexity of cryptography, um, ranging from algorithmica, um, a world where P equals MP, to cryptomania, where there's public key cryptography. And um, there's all these worlds in between, heuristica where P not equal to NP and NP is easy on average, Bessilon where NP is hard on average, but their one-way functions don't exist, and Minicrypt where one-way functions exist, but public key cryptography doesn't. And for these two worlds, Bessilon and Heuristica, um, one can ask, well, um, what exactly do you mean here by on average, by easy on average or hard on average? 
is an errorless sense or the error prone sense. Um, and this is uh, an important question. I mean, especially um, the context of some recent work. Um, so uh, Hirahara building on work by, um, by Kamal Simon Pazo, Kamal Koloklova showed that some um, very natural problems related to Komarov complexity, the minimum circuit size problem and the problem of uh, minimizing time on Komarov complexity have worst case to average case reductions. But there the average case hardness is zero error hardness. So the, the errorless heuristics, hardness in the errorless heuristic sense. And there's also exciting recent work by Liu and Pass showing how to base uh, one-way functions on the average case hardness of min KT, the problem of minimizing time-bound Komarov complexity. But there the hardness is on the is in um, the error-prone sense. So the question of connecting errorless hardness and error-prone hardness is very relevant to whether you can base one-way functions on worst case hardness of problems like uh, minimum time-bound Komarov complexity or not. So that's one motivation in the, con the context of recent work. And another one um, is, is about um, there's another notion of Komarov complexity, K little t complexity, where um, it's been shown in recent work by uh, Liu and Pass and by Ren and myself that um, in the when you're talking about um, the hardness in the errorless setting um, for that notion, that's equivalent to x not equal to BPP, but hardness in the error-prone setting is equal to the existence of one-way functions. So of course it's of interest to relate error-prone versus errorless hardness because if you could do that, then you could base cryptography in X particular to BPP, which would be at the very least a very surprising result. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so we're interested in kind of like looking more carefully at what these average case notions are and how they relate to each other. And in fact, Brazo asked this question in his original survey. So if this MP is in heuristic P, if you can solve distribution problems in NP um, in the error prone sense, can you also solve them in the error less sense? Um, and uh, yeah, here's a definition of the error prone sense. There is an algorithm such that it gives the right answer to the probability um, at least one minus one over K or, over the uh, distribution. And the error less sense, um, you require that for any um, instance, you either give the correct answer or don't know. And um, you require the original condition um, as in the case of heuristic P that the, um, you answer L of X with probability at least one minus one over K. Okay, so um, what do we, uh, uh, so and, and this uh, errorless notion is equal to Levin's notion of expected polynomial time. Um, so what do we show? Well, so the, the main sort of conceptual contribution is a connection with uh, the well-known notion of instance checkers. Um, uh, so an instance checker is sort of an Oracle procedure for a language where um, if you're given the language is Oracle, you always give the right answer. And if you're given some other Oracle, you give either the right answer or you say don't know with high probability. So that's um, sort of a notion that's been very well studied since the early 90s when it was defined by Blum and Kahneman. And um, it's closely related to theory of interactive proofs and PCPs. So um, what we show is that uh, these two notions of kind of on the one hand instance checking and the other hand of relating errorless and error prone complexity are very closely related. So if you have an instance checker for an NP complete problem, which is a long standing open question, complexity theory, to show that NP complete problems are instance checkable, then um, error prone heuristics do imply errorless heuristics for, uh, for, for NP. Um, and for example, if pH admits an interactive proof system with a pH honest prover, then um, that implies a, a kind of certain kind of instance checkability, which implies a connection for distributional pH. So let me, um, the current best result is just that you have interactive proofs with uh, honest provers in um, the, the, uh, the encountering P. So let me just describe the results more clearly. So our first result is, is an equivalence between reductions from errorless to error prone um, uh, average case complexity and a certain notion of instance checker, a slightly relaxed notion, a non-adaptive average BP slash poly instance checker. And so these two notions of, of kind of re reducing errorless to error prone and having instance checker of this sort are actually equivalent. We get an exact equivalence. In the previous slide, I suggested one direction of this going from instance checkability to a reduction, but you can show the other direction too if you relax the notion of instance checkability. Um, and so this provides a new approach for errorless to error prone reduction um, and relates our problem to a well known open problem uh, about instance checking NP. And we can, in fact, unconditionally construct um, a, a somewhat weaker notion of instance checkability. Instead of average BPP, if you ask about heuristic BPP slash poly instance checkers, we can construct them unconditionally. 
Um, and our second result is unconditional. So we give some unconditional results for the equivalence between errorless and error prone average case complexities for P and UP and say co UP. So, for example, if distributional problems in P are in NC1 in heuristic average case sense, then they're also in NC1 in, uh, in errorless average case sense. And note that um, the problem of finding like a worst case to average case reduction for P is a long standing open problem. So what we show is that if you want to relate errorless to error prone rather than worst case to average case, that is something you can do unconditionally. Um, and this goes through instance checking for P complete problems. And similarly, uh, we, we have a connection for UP into set core UP unconditionally. And the final result is about hitting set generators, such as PRGs. Um, so in the complexity theoretic deramization setting, it's known that hitting set generators are equivalent to PRGs. But in the cryptographic setting where the adversary can be more powerful than the generator, this is unknown. And um, we use our results to show some new equivalences between the two notions. For generators that are seed extending, where the first part of the output is just a seed. Um, so um, such generators cannot be secure in cryptographic setting, but they are interesting in the setting where, um, where uh, adversaries are uh, weaker than the generator. And we show a sort of an equivalence here that a Seed extending hitting set generator with non trivial seed length um, implies a hitting set generator with small seed length and the epsilon seed length. Um, and this is equivalent to PRGs. And like um, even the first two items, stretching the seed of an HSG, um, we don't have any other way of doing this rather than using our connection between errorless and error prone. So the way we show this theorem is that if, if one holds, then we use this to, to show um, errorless hardness. Uh, and then we show that since errorless hardness implies error prone hardness, we can use error prone hardness to build a PRG, and that implies two. So it goes through the connection between errorless and error prone hardness, and we have no way uh, that we know off of doing it directly. Um, so that's a little bit of, um, of a proof sketch. I don't know if there's time for that. How much time do I have, Vijay? Okay, one minute. Okay, let me just um, go straight to the um, uh, conclusion then. So, yeah. So we sort of initiated a study of relating errorless and error prone complexity. We have this kind of um, connection between instance checking, this long standing open question of whether NP complete models are instance checkers and whether you can relate errorless hardness to error prone hardness. Um, and then we have some unconditional results for P and UP and set co UP. And a couple of open questions remain. Um, first of all, whether you can construct an instance checker or even, even this weaker notion of instance checker for NP complete problems, which would imply that it could relate errorless and error prone hardness for NP, or can we present evidence against this? So a famous work of Bognau and Trevisan shows there's no non-adaptive worst case to average case reduction unless the prolonged hierarchy collapses. Um, an errorless to error prone reduction is a weaker uh, notion. And um, the question is whether we can extend the techniques of Bognau and Trevisan to also rule this out under some natural complexity assumption. Thanks. Thanks so much for uh, giving the talk. Uh... Yeah, so we should, we have some time for like one or two questions. Anyone have questions for Rahul? Hi Rahul, I have a quick question. In, in this Hi. equivalence, I, in this equivalence between PRGs and heating set generators, do you can you also prove it in the almost everywhere case, or is it just infinitely often? Thank you. Um, uh, that's a good question. I, I think it does work in uh, in both settings. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've got to kind of like think about it a bit more, but my intuition is that it does work in both settings because I think the um, the equivalence uh, between errorless and error prone for P, I think it doesn't depend on whether uh, you have IO almost everywhere. So that would be my I suspicion. See. I see, thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks Rahul. Yeah, I guess we have to move to the next speaker. Sure, uh, let me stop sharing. Yeah, thanks. Um, Dana, uh, uh, the, next, the next talk will be given by Dana on reduction for naive games to a Boolean unique game. So welcome, Dana. Okay, thank you, Reggie. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll speak about this uh, work with Onen and Dan. Uh, uh, all, uh, longer versions of this of this uh, talk are available online. Uh, so. You know, the, the, the point of this session, as far as I'm concerned, is to answer questions. So if anyone has any questions while I speak, just, just raise your hand and, and ask. Um, okay, so, uh, right, so this is, let me see here. 
Um, so this talk is about, um, uh, you know, is towards uh, proving the Unigames conjecture. If we ever to prove the Unigames conjecture, we should be able to show a reduction from a problem that we know is anti-hard uh, to the Unigames conjecture, to the Unigames problem. Um, in uh, 2006, in uh, 16, sorry, in stock 16, uh, Subhash Kot and I had a paper uh, that said, uh, let's just try to aim for the Boolean version of the Unigames conjecture. This is basically hardness of max cut. Um, and this is very much the heart of the Unigames conjecture. Um, and here is a problem that we proved was, was NP hard. Um, uh, and, and here is a candidate reduction that we have from this problem to Boolean Unigames. Um, so, so we had, we put forward this, this reduction, uh, we actually had that reduction for a long time before that, um, and, but, but we didn't have a proof uh, for, for this reduction. Um, and in fact, uh, the, there were some issues there. Um, so, so the main idea of, the, of that reduction it was instead of uh, using the long code in, in hardness of approximation reductions, instead encode uh, information with half spaces, um, which uh, no one did before that, uh, but, but we had good uh, reasons to, to uh, suggest that this, this would be good uh, uh, towards a hardness of Boolean unique games. Uh, for a technical reason, we used um, not quite half spaces, but, but what we call periodic half spaces. And some experts were kind of worried about this choice. Um, and, and indeed, we didn't, we didn't have a proof. And this new work, let, let me just say, right, there is also the question, assuming that you prove the Boolean version of the Unigames conjecture, can you prove, prove the, the full Unigames conjecture? This is a great question, uh, but, but right, this is known as strong pair repetition. We're not going to talk about this. Um, this is not the, the focus of this talk. Anyway, uh, so, so we wanted to go and, and, and analyze the, the stock 16 reduction. Um, and and uh, what we were able to do is, is basically analyze it. Uh, but instead of starting with a problem that we know is uh, NP hard, we start with a very similar problem that we don't know how to prove that it's NP hard. It is in the same spirit. Also for it, semi-definite programming algorithms won't do the trick. Um, but, uh, but from that, we're able to prove the, the, do the reduction. Let me say that we also figure out how to, we, we actually put forward uh, what at least I feel is the, is the right way to do the reduction from the non np hardness uh, results to Boolean uni games. So we get rid of these periodic half spaces. It's just based on, on half spaces. Um, it's also a, a, you know, an NP reduction. The original reduction was a, an exponential size reduction. It was only meant to, to, to um, uh, rule out uh, polynomial time algorithms for Boolean uni games. Uh, so, so we actually get a reduction. We, we have a candidate reduction that, that is an NP hardness reduction. Um, right, so polynomial size reduction uses only half spaces, um, but we still don't know how to prove that, but we are able to prove um, assuming this slightly different uh, um, uh, you know, uh, problem. Okay, so, so this is what's going on uh, in this work. Um, if anyone has any questions, this would be a good time to ask. This is the big picture slide. And if not, I'll just, I'll just continue. Um, okay. Uh, okay, good. Um, so uh, I need to tell you a few things. I need to tell you what's this Boolean Unigames conjecture. Um, I need to tell you um, what is this? So, so what is this? Uh, what's what's the known NP hardness result? What's the wish for NP hardness result? Um, and I need to tell you what what's going on in in this work. Uh, perhaps let me do it in an unusual uh, setup. 
um, let me just skip to the end and tell you something about what comes into the proof. Um, so, so in order to analyze uh, this reduction, right? This is this was extremely challenging, um, and uh, we went and proved a new concentration theorem or a new low degree testing theorem um, that uh, I think is of, of completely independent interest. So let me tell you about that a little. Um, so suppose that you have some some function. So we're talking about real functions, uh, you know, on the two norm. Um, and you have some uh, constant degree, and then you take this, uh, you take the space, uh, and then you consider random, um, a random hyperplane uh, in this space. So this is of dimension one minus the, the total dimension of the space. You could look at the function uh, restricted to the hyperplane, and you can ask what's the what's the degree d part. Right, so, so uh, right, uh, just like there is Fourier analysis of the, over uh, the, the Boolean hypercube, um, you can also have uh, over real functions. So, so uh, there is Hermit uh, expansion, there is uh, Gegenbauer expansion. Gegenbauer is over the sphere, uh, Hermit is over the Gaussian space. Um, right, and, and this is notion of uh, degree D part, right? What's the low degree of the function is, is well defined. So you can look at this restricted function. You can look at what's this low degree part of this restricted function. And what we prove is that this local uh, low degree part of the function is actually very close to the global uh, low degree part of the function. So, so this is the global low degree part, now here restricted to the hyperplane. Those two are extremely similar. Uh, they're similar. Uh, up to one over the dimension of the function, um, right? So, so this is uh, exactly what we call uh, low degree testing theorems. There is, uh, you know, what's the low degree part locally versus what's the low degree part globally, and the two are, are similar. Um, you can use sort of Fourier analysis techniques and, and prove some result of this sort, but this would only give you one over square root k, which is which is not. Uh, would be useless completely for, for our needs, uh, for this Unigames conjecture. Um, and, and the truth is that the, the, the right deviation is, is one over K, one over the dimension. And the tight example is, is a half space. Um, and, and we actually proved that this is the right deviation uh, with high probability for, for all functions. Um, and it's actually, it's a very interesting technique. Um, so the, the technique is uh, use uh, Schur's Lehmann uh, presentation theory. And you say that, um, that uh, the function, um, right, the, 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 the second moment of, uh, of, of this actually only depends on the spectrum of the function and not on the function itself. And this uh, uh, reduces the problem to a problem in two-dimensional space. Still, it's a very difficult problem in two-dimensional space, and this is, uh, you know, why we, we need to uh, prove stuff. Um, but but it is uh, an easier setting to work with. Uh, this technique was used once before for a sampling theorem, right? You have a function, and you ask what's the average globally and what's the average on a hyperplane, so this was done in a paper of uh, Dead Regev and Boz Klartag. Um, it's uh, extremely non-trivial that you can take a technique that works um, um, for sampling just for averages, right? This is the degree zero part of the function and actually lift it to general uh, low degree part of the function to, to low degree testing. Um, and, and this is what we were able to do with, with quite a lot of effort. Um, yeah, so, so this is the main technical uh, uh, theorem that, that uh, goes into the analysis, the new analysis of the reduction. Um, out there, I think that I probably used much of my time. Um, are there any questions? I have one minute. I have a quick question if I can. Is, it, is the result uh, such as this also available over other domains? So if I understand correctly, this over the 
k-dimensional sphere. Mm -hmm. All Would stuff I, in space, yeah. Is, is something like this over uh, like the hypercube known, do you know? Would you in the hypercube, we call such things low degree testing field. Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're known with the same, uh, this one over k thing is the so same. Uh, usually, yeah, the, when we talk about low degree testing theorems, often we consider much lower dimensional uh, local parts. Um, here we we only needed quite high dimensional, um, yeah. But but this spirit of of theorems uh, yeah, is very well known in you know over discrete discrete domains, um, but but we are able to prove it over uh, Gaussian space, um, right? With with tight parameters, which which was right. This was where the challenge was. I see a vague question. Are there different notions of reductions that could be of interest in this setting? You mean for uni games? Uh, yeah, no, uh, of course, many, many versions of reductions could be interesting. Um, uh, right, you don't have to prove NP hardness, you could prove, you could prove uh, other, um, other results except that we don't know how to do those things. Um, yeah, but I mean, we, we do have a candidate, uh, candidate uh, reduction that would prove NP hardness and, and I, I believe it, I, I stand behind it. I believe it with all my heart. Um, well, I think we have to move on to the next talk. Uh, thanks so much, Dana, for the, the exciting talk about Game conjecture. And uh, the next talk will be given by uh, Gail and uh, are you two giving the talk together? Yes. Okay, great, great. So who is the other person? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 maybe you can share the share screen and... Uh... Oh, Ri Riyadh, okay. So welcome Riyadh and Gail for, for the pseudo random stuff reduction for empty complete problem. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. Um, so my name is Gal. I'm here with Riyadh, and today we'll talk about pseudo random self reductions for NP complete problems. Um, our starting point is random self reduction. We say that the language L is randomly self reducible if the signed in membership in L can be reduced in polynomial time to the signed in membership in L for uniformly random instances. As we can see here in this slide, so we, ha we have our worst case instance X, um, and we can reduce the, the signing membership in L in polynomial time to the signing membership of these random queries um, to L. There are famous examples um, and included discrete logarithm and the permanent of a matrix. Um, now, these two problems are assumed not to be NP-complete, and so it is natural to ask if we can find um, an NP-complete language with a random self-reduction, uh, and the answer is a conditional no. Finding and Fortrow for prove that unless the polynomial hierarchy collapses at the third level, there is no non-adaptive random self-reduction for NP-complete problems. Here, non-adaptive means that future queries cannot depend on previous queries of the reduction. Um, and the proof idea is that if we have a language L um, in NP and it admits a non-adaptive random self-reduction, then we can construct um, an AM poly protocol for the complement of L. These results were later improved by um, Bogdanov and Trevisan. Um, yes. So one relaxation suggested by Hirihara and Santanam is to consider pseudo-random self-reduction. Um, and so the random self-reduction basically says that instead of requiring the queries of the reduction to be random, we require them to be pseudo-random with respect to some complexity class. And here we use um, the definition of pseudo-randomness. So we say that the sequence of distribution is uh, pseudo-random with respect to C. If we cannot, if every member in the class C cannot distinguish between um, a sample drawn from distri distribution and, and a uniform sample with a distinguishing advantage more than um, epsilon n. And here in this talk, we will consider epsilon n to be 
a function that goes to zero. So it's going to be a little O of one and not a constant. So the notion of pseudo-random self-reduction is very similar. And here's the analogous slide. Uh, we have our worst case in, uh, instance X, and we want to reduce the membership, uh, descending membership in L in polynomial time, of course, um, to design in membership in L for a pseudo-random shares. So here the queries to the reductions um, are pseudo-random. Um, okay, so first let's see an example for a problem also given by Irihara and Santanam that admits a pseudo-random self-reduction and we don't know for real random reduction for it. Um, and this problem is the uh, minimum circuit size problem, the MCSP. Uh, the input is a truth table of some function and the output is the size of the smallest Boolean circuits that computes um, this truth table. Sorry. Okay, so here we are in Santaman show the pseudo-random self uh, reduction for the MCSP. Um, and we have good reasons to believe that MCSP is not NP complete. Um, and they ask if it is possible to have a pseudo-random self reduction for NP complete. Um, and they suggested that maybe um, the existence of a pseudo-random self reduction for MCSP further distinguishes MCSP for NP completeness. And the reduction, the way that it works is we take the instance for the MCSP, which is just a truth table, as we can see here, and we XOR it with the output of exponentially secure pseudo-random generator. Um, now, the output is pseudo-random almost by definition, um, and they proved that this operation does not change the answer to the MCSP by much. Um, that means that the output of this um, XOR is going to have roughly the same um, circuit size as um, X. And essentially we characterize very high level reasons for this reduction, uh, for why this reduction worked. Um, and we found that this reduction worked because there exists some pseudo-random distribution D um, with small values uh, for the MCSP problem, uh, whereas random inputs have large value. And XOR in with this distribution roughly keeps the value of X. And now the question is whether we can find some NP complete problem that will also um, satisfy these properties. Um, and this is what we did in this work. So the first thing that we show is that the max, max click problem admits a non-adaptive pseudo-random self-reduction. And the hardness assumption that we use is the non-uniform planted click. Actually, the same, uh, proof, uh, the same proof that we had actually proves a slightly stronger theorem. It proves that for every non-trivial hereditary property pi, the problem of finding, um, given an input graph G, the largest subgraph in pi, it also admits a pseudo-random self-reduction. Um, again, assuming the non-uniform planted click. So um, what is uh, the non-uniform planted click assumption? So we have two distributions. The first one is the uniform distribution over a graph with n vertices. And the second one is a distribution where we planted a click of size n to the power of epsilon in this random graph. And the conjecture is that this distribution is pseudo-random. Uh, with respect to polynomial size circuits. Um, and more formally, we assume that there exists some epsilon between zero and a half and some tau between zero and one, um, such that any sequence of polynomial size circuits, um, we have this condition, which basically means that they cannot distinguish between the uniform distribution and the planted distribution with an advantage larger than um, one over n to the power of tau. Um, yes, yeah, so, Basically, now Riyadh will explain about the reduction, the connections to the MCSP. Hi. Yeah, so I will be showing the reduction. It's actually not very complex. Uh, given a graph G with the uh, N vertices, the reduction F does the following. First, it chooses a random subset, uh, S of size N to the power of epsilon. Uh, it fixes the edges in S, and everything else is, is uh, then randomized. So an edge uh, inside this will stay if it existed before. Uh, edges uh, outside of S or uh, with one side outside of S will, will be random after, uh, after applying it. 
So what properties does uh, this reduction have? First, uh, if G has a click of size K, then F of G has a click of size uh, K divided by n to the power, power one minus epsilon on average, uh, because uh, the size of the intersection of K and uh, of the click and S is K n to the power of epsilon divided by n. Uh, so the high probability it will be at least k half of that, which is k divided by two times into the power of five minus epsilon, which means that the critical size doesn't uh, decrease by much. And uh, the second property is that the uh, click size of, of f of g is not larger than the click size of g plus three log n with high probability. Uh, that's because the click size of f of g is bounded by the click size of uh, on s and the click size on the complement of s. The click size on S it has, is at most the click size of G. And on the complement, it's two log N on average and uh, less than three log N with high probability. So total it is the original click size plus three log N. The third property is pseudo-randomness is that the distribution F of G is indistinguishable from the random, uh, the uniform distribution. Uh, why is that true? Uh, now assumes that, that some adversary uh, can distinguish between f of g and the random graph r, then uh, the graph, consider the graph f of g xor g. This graph, of course, has an independent set on s, and everything else is random. Uh, so the graph f of g xor g xor k, with k with, where k is a complete graph, has a click in s with size n to the power of epsilon, and everything else is random. So this is exactly the planted click uh, uh, distribution. For the graph uh, R, R, X, or G, X, or K is of, course just, is of course just random. So we get that this adversary could distinguish between uh, a graph with a planted click of size n to the power of epsilon and the uniform, and the, and the uniform graph, uh, which exactly contradicts uh, our conjecture. Uh, actually, a very similar trick was used in the MCSP case to prove pseudo-randomness. Uh, so we have three properties uh, that the click size doesn't decrease by much, uh, by more than O, uh, by a factor of more than O n to the power of one minus epsilon. Uh, so what we have here is uh, a pseudo-random self-reduction that approximates click up to a factor of O n to the power of one, uh, one minus epsilon, which is known to be NP-hard. So uh, there's a reduction from this, from click to the approximation of click, and then a reduction from approximation. I have to wrap to... up in one minute, one minute. Yeah. Uh, so we can compose this reduction and get a pseudo-random self-reduction from click to itself. Uh, so, why did this reduction work? First, uh, a click is small random, random inputs. It's very hard to approximate and has some property of uh, localness or stability. That is, uh, fixing just a small subset uh, of the input is enough to keep the output roughly the same. Uh, we're roughly the same in our case is n to the power of one, uh, one minus epsilon. And turns out that every hereditary property uh, problem has these same properties, uh, so they are uh, uh, still very local, of course, and uh, hard to approximate up to one n to the power of one epsilon. Uh, they're also uh, small enough for random inputs for for our uh, reduction to work. So, thank you. We are running late actually, so maybe we don't have time for questions. If you have any questions, you can ask them out of in the chat. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. So the next talk will be given by Rahul as well, I think. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Let me just share my slides. Thanks, Ligia. So um, this uh, talk is on um, paper called Excluding pH Specimen, again, joint work with Shuichi. Um, okay, so here uh, the, um, the context and motivation are all to do with in part of those five words um, of average case complexity, um, where uh, 
yeah, it's 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 sort of trying to understand where we are in our quest to understand average case complexity in cryptography and, and what the central questions are. Um, and so there are these five worlds where the um, the, the one uh, that would be sort of the, the most surprising one in some ways is, is algorithmica, where P is equal to NP. Um, and then um, there are all the, these other worlds where P not equal to NP and where differing degrees of average case hardness and cryptography are possible. And it seems very, very difficult to separate algorithmica from these other worlds. I mean, to, to know whether algorithmica is true or not is NP versus P problem, which I believe to be a very, very hard problem. So um, it seems that it's quite hopeless as of now. Um, but we can hope to say something about these, these other intermediate worlds. So what are these other intermediate worlds? So this, ex this other extreme world is cryptomania, that exists public key cryptography. Um, and this again is a world that's very, very hard to, to rule out or, or to show it holds. Um, but then there's these intermediate worlds where, um, so in heuristica, you have worst case hardness of NP, but average case easiness. NP is hard in the worst case, but it's easy in the average case. There's Pessiland, which um, is given that name because it's somehow the worst of all possible words in that you have average case hardness, so you can't solve problems you'd like to solve um, on average. And at the same time, you don't have cryptography, so um, you can't use um, sort of average case hardness um, to solve cryptographic tasks. So um, one of the nice things about complexity theory is sort of a win-win situation where either a problem is easy or if it's hard, maybe it can be used uh, for see randomness and cryptography and Pestilent is a world where, yeah, that doesn't happen to the extent uh, you'd like. Um, then there's Minicrypt where secret key cryptography one-way functions exist, but public key cryptography doesn't. So um, despite the fact that these two worlds, algorithmia and cryptomania are very hard to rule out, we have some hope maybe of reducing the possibilities and at least ruling out this intermediate worlds. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's something that we can, can aspire to do. Um, so we are especially interested in ruling out Pessiland and Heuristica because uh, that seems more within reach. And though uh, we don't seem to have the techniques yet to do that, what we do in this paper is uh, to consider um, sort of like uh, uh, an analogous worlds uh, where these problems become somewhat easier and try to make progress in, uh, on these questions, on, the, on these questions in that analogous world. Um, so yeah, the ultimate goal is to decide which of these worlds is a true one. We, many of us probably believe that cryptomania is the world we live in, but even ruling out algorithmica seems very hard and we made very little progress. And we instead look at um, kind, of, um, uh, kind of a relaxed version of this where we consider the pH versions of these, of these five possible worlds. So um, uh, instead of considering NP versus P, we consider the polynomial hierarchy versus P. So pH algorithmica is just the world where pH equals P. Of course, it's the same as NP equals P because um, we know that um, pH contains NP and NP equals P implies that the whole of polynomial hierarchy collapses. pH heuristica is a world where pH is hard in the worst case, but it's easy on average. To define pH pestilent is not um, that obvious because um, it's not quite clear what the pH analog of a one-way function would be but at least the pH analog of a CRM generator makes um, yeah, some intuitive sense. So we consider that instead. pH pestilent is a world where pH is hard and average and there don't exist pH computable CRM generators. Um, and the other two worlds uh, are about pH computable public key crypto, which again is, is not quite clear what that should mean. So we don't consider it here. We, we're more interested in uh, pH pestilent and pH heuristica. An earlier work of Shuichi's uh, proves some very interesting results about pH heuristica. And in this paper are focuses on pH pestilent. Um, so um, I should note here that unlike with the original five words of Napaglia, so there is very little relevance to cryptography here because being able to compute um, a generator or, or in the polynomial hierarchy uh, doesn't make it at all practical in any way. So it's not really kind of helping us from the crypto point of view. It's more that it maybe helps us understand where the difficulties of these problems are. Um, lie and uh, help us to make partial progress. So it's very much about kind of developing techniques to make partial progress in these problems. Um, so what we do is we rule out pH pestilent in kind of various settings. So um, uh, unconditional, and there's an unconditional kind of result. Um, it turns out to be quite easy to do that in the non-uniform setting. It follows almost immediately from, from other work, but the uniform setting, it takes, it takes more work and there's some interesting open 
questions that remain. So um, we basically show that yeah, pH is hard on average, equal to the exist pH computable PRGs um, in the non-uniform setting and even the uniform setting with, with small stretch. Um, so this world where you have hardness on average and the existence of PRGs uh, and PRGs don't exist is just false. It, it, it just doesn't hold. But uh, the question of the pH heuristic uh, uh, exists is still open. And it's, it's sort of an interesting open question. So um, the previous work on pH heuristic was by, uh, by Shuichi, where um, he showed an interesting connection between um, average case hardness of problems in pH, the distribution of pH being hard on average, and um, the worst case hardness of a problem related to Komogorov complexity. So um, the problem of minimizing time-bound Komogorov complexity um, with a pH oracle. So uh, there's an interesting equivalence between a worst case hardness result and an average case hardness result for pH. Um, and it turns out that this is also equivalent to um, some kind of mild C randomness phenomenon. You get a pH computable hitting set generator or some sort of complexity separation of PNE from multiple CPP. And morally, what this implies is that pH heuristica is excluded if you can show somehow that this problem gap min KT to the pH is NP hard, that uh, every NP problem reduces to it. And that's, um, that's something that we, that we don't know yet. If we knew that, then um, we'd be able to rule out pH heuristica. So the previous work of, of Shuichi reduces the question of ruling out pH heuristica to showing NP hardness of, um, of this problem. Uh, and um, just to kind of refer to my previous talk, the, the notion of average case hardness here is always uh, uh, errorless, uh, is errorless average case hardness. And what we do is it means to consider error prone average case hardness. So we, when we consider Pestilin, we consider uh, error prone average case hardness. Um, and we uh, so look at the assumption that this pH is not a heuristic PPP. And we unconditionally rule this out. So um, we present equivalence between pH computable serum generators, average case hardness of pH, and average case hardness of this meta complexity problem, this problem about time bounded um, complexity with the pH oracle. And um, yeah, perhaps the most interesting aspect of our work is that this, um, this problem, showing that this problem is this phenomenon hierarchy complete, even in error prone sense. So even when you consider error, error prone average case hardness, this problem is just pH complete. Um, so there's two sets of results, one the non-uniform case, one the uniform case. And the non-uniform case, um, if you have average case hardness of pH or the uniform distribution, then um, you get average case hardness of this problem min KT to the pH, also the uniform distribution. That gives a natural example of um, a problem, a distributional problem that's average case hard in their prone setting for pH. And this implies the existence of pH computer PRGs with non-trivial seed length or with seed length that's um, n to the epsilon or a stretched polynomial. Um, and uh, yeah, so this kind of is all about error-prone complexity while the previous work was about uh, errorless average case hardness. And I should mention that these directions one implies three and four are kind of fairly straightforward by applying the nissan Vinson generator. And this, for this theorem, the more interesting directions are uh, four and three implies one and um, uh, yeah, and one implies two. Um, and we also uh, get equivalence with um, some other uh, kind of uh, condition where you have actually polynomial stretch. Um, so this is a uniform case. So the previous results are non-uniform case. In the uniform case, we get very similar results, except that um, the stretch of the PRG we can get from average case hardness is uh, sort of uh, smaller. It's order log n. Um, and uh, we're not, we don't know how to uh, get polynomial stretch in this case. And we can get polynomial stretch um, at the expense of having sort of a disjunction. Either we get polynomial stretch or we get um, like a, a tally language it's in pH, but not in BPP. So that's sort of like um, um, a qualifier or a rider to this result. Ideally, we'd like to eliminate this and just get a polynomial stretch unconditionally. So, um, so the yeah the main shortcoming of the result is that we order log n stretch. What we really want is a PRG with polynomial stretch. But for this result, um, the hard direction is actually getting a PRG with order log n stretch. And the other direction um, is uh, it's not trivial, but it can be done uh, using a previous work by using a PRG to get average case hardness. So in general, what we're doing is kind of establishing the equivalence of average case hardness and C randomness for pH uh, against. Um, 
uh, both uniform and non-uniform adversaries. Um, and the, the main open problem here is whether you could whether the existence of a polynomial stretch PH computable PRG is equal to average case of, of, of PH, whether you can remove this condition here. So in conclusion, I mean, our results might hint at an approach towards excluding the standard person. Well, yeah, so in some sort of like mirror world, uh, which is much simpler than our, uh, uh, our world is complicated in this mirror world. It's things that are a bit simpler. We're able to exclude Pessilin. It's possible that we might be able to exclude heuristica as well. And perhaps we can build on these techniques to say something about Pessilin heuristica in our real world. Um, and the open questions, uh, so, and very interesting open question from the perspective of uniform worst case, um, uh, of uniform hardness randomness trade-offs is whether we can show that average case hardness of pH against uniform adversaries implies a polynomial stretched pH computable PRG. That's something we don't know how to do. I mentioned this before. And is there kind of a nice way, a natural way of formulating pH minicrypt and ruling that out? And might that give us some insight into, um, into minicrypt in, uh, our, uh, in, in our real world. That's all I have to say, thanks. Thanks so much for the talk. So that, that's the last part of this uh, session. We have, one, we have time for one more question. So if you have a question, just ask him. Uh, hello, hello. Uh, hi, uh, hi. Uh, 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 are your uh, reductions number of books like in the sense of uh, Shiji's previous works? Oh uh, no no they're uh, they're pretty black box actually I mean, yeah oh. so that's it, that, so yeah uh, we don't, we don't really have like any kind of non black box techniques going but it's interesting to see whether the non black box techniques might be useful. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Mm. Well uh, okay so I should add to that I mean so for the, in the uniform case so in the non uniform case it's all kind of black box in the uniform case um, there's kind of like uh, when there's a result we get with advice, which is black box, but then removing the advice is non black box. So there is a non black box component, but it's not um, as powerful as it is in Shuichi's result somehow. And it'd be mm -hmm. nice to kind of extend the power of that. Yeah, mm. yeah thanks so much for. Yeah, so let's thank Rahul again. And uh, also, thanks everyone for coming to this session. Uh, sorry for running late a bit. I guess we also started late. So, yeah. So the next session will start at 1 p.m. So, so stay tuned if you want to go. Yeah, so that's all. Thanks so much everyone for coming.